For over half a century, the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico was the largest single-dish telescope on Earth, a source of countless astronomical breakthroughs. So when Arecibo dramatically collapsed in 2020, it was mourned around the world. But despite this tragedy, Arecibo's legacy lives on and continues to inspire a new generation of scientists. I'm really pleased to welcome today Abel Mendez. He is the director of the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo. We're also pleased to be joined by Genesis Ferrer, who is a physics student at the university. You know, I, I'm really, uh, I wanted to get into some of your, the work that you're doing with exoplanets and astrobiology. But um, first, you know, in many ways, Arecibo has been on our minds uh, and, uh, all around the world, it, we're really saddened to have seen um, the collapse of it in uh, the, uh, in 2020. Um, I can't imagine how much more that resonates when you're working at the telescope. So I just wanted to start by asking you, um, how how are things on the ground? Well, we are trying uh, to now to move forward. It was a great loss for everybody, and not personally and professionally. But now we are thinking on the future and uh, trying to get uh, the best instrument that we can get there for the observatory. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you too, uh, NSC's considering, you know, you, I think you wanted to really do observing time. You're at the beginning of your career. Um, you know, what did, what did Arecibo mean to you and, and how would you like to see the observatory maybe get a second life in the future? Arecibo means so much to not only me, but a lot of the students of the University of Puerto Rico, specifically physics students. I guess um, every student um, who ever wants to go into astrophysics or astrobiology, it's always been our dream to work as part of the radio telescope. And that's, uh, it's kind of, it's very sad that we don't have that technology in Puerto Rico anymore. And now um, a lot of us have to migrate to different parts of the U.S. to research with other radio telescopes, even though I'm still researching with the Arecibo Observatory. So it's 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 very hard that the students of Puerto Rico who are interested in astrophysics um, can't do that particular kind of radio telescope research in in our homeland. It's such a global tragedy, but it is seems so you know completely so much more resonant for Puerto Rico, given that it's this iconic structure and so much a part of the identity of the island. Um, yeah, we're all, we're all really sorry for the for the loss of it. You know, this is really the first telescope that had that kind of ambition, right? Then the ability to um, to see so deep into space and also just like, I love the structure in terms of its just clear hugeness and, and amazing how it looks in the lush um, depression there, like it's no wonder why it shows up in Contact and in Ted Chiang stories and in Bond movies, right? It's just an amazing structure. So um, yeah, could you just speak to that legacy? Well, I can say that uh, I can't believe that the first engineers and scientists that built the uh, first Arecibo telescope, it was a dream machine. It mm. was a sci-fi machine, totally something that uh, uh, yeah, hard to construct. It was a, it's a, it was a long way, but then you will have the best instrument in the world. So we have the first uh, uh, maps of Venus under, under the clouds from the Arecibo Observatory. And we have the rotation rates of the planets also, Mercury and, and Venus. And uh, that was something expected because we have the capability. But uh, then much later in 1992, the first exoplanets were discovered. That was not planned. And that was a huge <laughs> achievement. Then we observed uh, these uh, pulsars, uh, stars, and uh, discovered a binary pulsars. And from that, we test the general theory of relativity. That was something that we were not planning to, and that uh, received a Nobel Prize 
for that, for the first indirect detection of gravitational waves. Speaking of all of these amazing discoveries that have come from the telescope, your, you know, your planetary habitability laboratory, I love just the name of that, right? It just evokes <laughs> all these watery worlds or like planets. And um, we're really in such a golden age of that. So um, could you just tell me a little bit about the laboratory and what your research is all about? Yes, the Planetary Habitability Laboratory is a research and education laboratory dedicated to the study of the suitability uh, for life of Earth, the solar system, and extrasolar planets. And it says Earth because that's the comparison basis for anything else. Our lab was established uh, 10 years ago and we mostly develop theoretical models about how to measure and apply habitability models to different environments. But we also use the receiver observatories to understand the space environment at our star with no potentially habitable plants. But mostly our work is theoretical, but we do this experimental or observational work with using the receiver telescope. And, you know, when you're assessing habitability of other worlds and, you know, Hennessy, I would love your take on this, too. What what are the kind of um, signals that you would be looking for in an exoplanet um, that would signal perhaps this is a place that could ha host life? I have been working specifically at looking um, at red dwarf stars with planets. So I, I look at the spectrums or like the flares emitted from specific stars. And, and, and red dwarf stars, just because our audience is general audience, what, what are they? How are they different from our sun? Yeah, so um, we look at red dwarf stars. Our, our, our sun is not a red dwarf. It's, it's a normal star. I guess it's kind of passing through its like normal um, lifetime. Red dwarf stars are a lot hotter and they tend to be in occasion smaller, I think. And we study uh, specific emissions or flares um, that, uh, that these stars might in certain occasions emit. We emit radio telescopes to, to the specific stars, we obtain their data and then we analyze and we see uh, if specific flares are, are shown throughout the spectrum. We can use the analogy of the classical elements to understand what are the requirements of life on, in general. Life needs air, that's a gas, water, a liquid, earth, a solid, and fire, that's the energy. <laughs> and that's a very beautiful analogy because now the, you have that in your mind that everybody is, anybody is, is telling you this place is habitable, just think about those. Because for example, if we are talking about at the planetary scale, this translates uh, to the planet has to have an atmosphere, has to have an hydrosphere, oceans, has to have a lithosphere, land, and together with the energy source like uh, sunlight. I know, Abel, you have, um, you have developed, uh, helped to develop the Earth Similarity Index, right? This idea of trying to have, have a system for assessing exoplanets. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that and how a planet um, is able to be similar to Earth? Is it just a matter of looking at size or mass or, do, or are there other factors that go into that? So 10 years ago, when we uh, developed, we started uh, our uh, lab, one of the reasons was uh, to create a catalog of potentially habitable worlds. We had at that time two candidates only, and uh, I, I probably... I was thinking that maybe create a catalog for two objects and maybe there won't be that many in the years to come. That would be something unnecessary. But no, no, I was wrong. They, we needed the catalog. Now I cannot remember the name of all these uh, words. In the last 30 years, thousands of exoplanets um, have been discovered of all sorts of shapes and sizes, but it kind of drives home how special Earth is. So I just want to know what, what this exoplanet research field is doing to kind of shed light on our own planet, its uniqueness, and if there are lessons that we're learning about uh, how special habitability is here. I think when I think of space, I, I always think of the Cassini mission. I know that in one of the missions, they took this picture from Saturn. They took a picture back to see kind of the Earth. And there was like this very small speck in the space and it was a bright light and that was Earth. And I guess that that's where I felt so intrigued to study space, right? And um, I, we, we always hear these 
physical questions like is the universe expanding where when did the universe start and uh, I guess just trying to figure out uh, how ex how unique exactly we are and how we compare to different planets in different solar systems or so far away the study of space isn't only just to have kind of an idea of uh, what's out there but it also gives us an idea of how we started and how um, the formation of our planets became. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's really interesting that the more we look out into space, the sharper relief we see our own world in. And uh, it's a really like huge benefit of space that is perhaps not talked about enough. And I love those pictures of Earth from afar. It's just very, it drives it home. What initially got me into space was my first visit ever um, into science, specifically physics, was to the Adesiva Observatory. When I was in like ninth grade or 10th grade, I was very young and my professors took me to Adesivo Observatory. I remember seeing, um, talking to the people who worked there, uh, participating, seeing the ginormous plate. I could never wrap my brain around it. And they used words like lasers and radiation and emissions. And um, I said, yeah, I need to learn about that. And I decided to go into physics. Um, because I knew that through physics, I could learn a lot about the space and a lot about the universe. And that's kind of what always intrigued me is um, the answer as to why certain things move or why certain things function the way they do. Uh, and then uh, for my career, I really, I'm, I wanna apply to PhD programs. I, I'm graduating uh, next year. So I do hope to uh, start a PhD in physics. Uh, um, and, you know, just kind of bring back science to Puerto Rico. I feel like that's a very important aspect. I, I would love to um, broaden the horizons of physics for every different research field, specifically for like Latina women and um, people in Puerto Rico. I feel like it's very important. Uh, at least in my career, I'm really interested in research and outreach. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's such a, I mean, it's, it's to be inspired first by this iconic um, scientific structure in Puerto Rico, and then to pay that forward and, and you know, continue to help uh, like have flourishing and on the islands, really, really cool.